Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. Happy to welcome in Kaylee Greer. Welcome to the event space, Kaylee. How are you doing? Today? I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I, everything's well, everything's wonderful, bright, brilliant, sparkly. It's the holiday season. I'm thrilled. How are you? Uh, you, you know, I, I don't even want to talk after that because you are so <laughs> pumped up and ready to go. I'm, I'm loving the excitement. I'm loving the energy. Kaylee is here talking with us today about the secrets to capturing the best dog photos ever, not just today, but ever. Of all okay? time in the known That's universe. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so get a notebook out, get something, some kind of recording device, although this will be available for replay. You could always watch this again, vimeo.com slash BH event space. You could check it out again. If you miss something, no need to freak out. Okay. But I do want to say a huge thank you to our host of the event Canon. So thank you very much to them without them. We can't, we can't link up with awesome people like Kaylee. So huge thanks to them. Everybody who's joining us here, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it. If you do have any questions for Kaylee and you're joining us here on Zoom, maybe this is your first time, use the Q&A tab. We'll get questions over to her and answer those towards the end of this segment. Otherwise, if you're joining on Vimeo and Facebook, you can just use the comment section and we'll make sure to get those over as well. But otherwise, no one came to see me, Kaylee. They're here to see you. So thanks for being here. I'm going to get out of the way and turn over everything to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here. Like I said, to everybody who is joining us, thank you so much for coming. I truly have no clue how many people are joining us because all I can see on this screen at my moment is uh, at this moment is my giant red head. So hold the phone because I'll change that for you. <laughs> and one second here, let me get my technical hat on and switch over to ta -da! what you really came here for, which is the secrets to capturing the best dog photos ever. So Kaylee, without I'm just going to interrupt real quick. I'm going to tell you, I think maybe stop sharing the screen again and then reshare it because we're getting a little bit of banding on the bottom. We're missing the bottom portion of it. I think you just have to reshare oh, gotcha. the Oh, gotcha. Okay. Let me ask you this. Boop, boop, boop. There, if I'm... Oh, there you go. Is that better? Okay. Now we're in business. I could see what was happening on my end. This is getting wild over here. Okay. Hold we it. We're just got some technical stuff to deal with um, because this was happening earlier and it's like the size of the window on my side and then if there's like another window that like overlaps it at all it, it has a small fit how's that look it looks amazing perfect, perfect. i love it thank you <laughs> appreciate you um so yes now without further ado let's get into it the secrets to capturing the best dog photos ever with your truly <laughs> There we go. <laughs> I didn't know my face was going to be up the whole time that was happening. So I had to just, you know, like fill in the spaces awkwardly with this small dance. So thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> but um, anyway, it's so awesome to be here. And before I start, um, I just wanted to just take a second to thank you so much to B&H for having me and to my friends at Canon for making this happen. Um, it, it is truly humbling to be able to work with two of the greatest forces in the, in the world today that are moving the photography industry ever forward. So thank you to both of you again for having me and facilitating all of this magic. Um, and to all of you who have come here to kind of hang out with me for the next hour and go on a dog hair covered adventure, <laughs> I appreciate you and I'm so grateful that you're here. Um, so I'm your redheaded host. I'm Kaylee Greer. <laughs> I have a ton of stuff to tell you today. And um, if anybody knows anything about me, brevity is not my strong suit, nor has it ever been. So <laughs> I'll try to pay as much attention to that today as possible and try to move through these things because I have so much to share with you. But before I start, what I'll say is, um, you know, like when you're at a party, like you go to a party, you show up and, uh, you know, you're kind of meeting like all these people maybe for the first time. And so people are kind of standing around in a, like a, in a circle in a group and they're like, so, you know, like, what do you do? You know, oh, what do you do? And someone's like, oh, I'm, a, I'm an IT. And then someone else is like, I'm an in vitro neurosurgeon. How about you? 
<laughs> and I say, oh, I'm a professional dog photographer. And uh, and I think like <laughs> everybody lets out like a little chuckle and they're probably all secretly thinking like, oh, so you're unemployed. <laughs> Or at best, they're thinking of like puppies and baskets or in front of like a tie dye backdrop, like at the mall, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but what they don't know is that I've been on this crazy dog photography adventure now, photographing dogs professionally all over the world for 12 years. And I have met some incredible people, traveled through unbelievable landscapes, and most importantly, photographed unforgettable dogs. So the thing is, though, right? Everyone starts somewhere. And for me, that somewhere 12 years ago was my local shelter. I was just a girl with a borrowed camera, um, a Canon 70, for those of you who are keeping track. Um, I barely had a grasp on the exposure triangle when I first started. But my reason for being at the shelter, my why was undeniable. It was always the dogs themselves. Um, you know, I just started off as, as a volunteer at the shelter and really I was cleaning up the dog's cages. I was taking them for walks. I was feeding them just kind of doing that sort of day-to-day -day thing that the dogs needed for their daily care. But at the shelter is where I realized that a photograph has this unprecedented magical power to tell a story, to, you know, kind of give a voice to an animal who has no way to voice, uh, the, excuse me, to speak for themselves. So, um, I felt like my camera had the ability to kind of potentially rewrite the endings to these dog stories. And when I was there and I was doing all this stuff, like, you know, taking them for walks and cleaning their cages, um, that's where I realized that they all had such a unique and individual personality. And, and I felt like, wow, I, I wish that I could show the world what these dogs kind of had to say. Um, I wish that, you know, I could get somebody to stop and pay attention just for one second, you know, to what these dogs, um, you know, are going through and kind of what, what their stories are and how could I tell those stories? Um, so it was all, it was with all that in mind that I borrowed that first Canon 7D. Um, it wasn't mine. <laughs> I borrowed it, uh, just for, you know, a day a week to take to the shelter, uh, which quickly turned into a couple of days a week to take the shelter. Um, and I was going to use that camera to try to do just that, to try to give a voice to the voiceless. I was determined to take a photo that was good enough, eye-catching enough to make someone stop scrolling for one second and consider that dog. Maybe consider adopting that dog. Consider making that dog a part of their family because not for nothing, oftentimes I would see dogs with adoption profile photos that looked like this. And I know, I know you look at it and you're like, oh my gosh, you think it's an exaggeration, right? But this is a photo that I quite literally plucked off of the shelter's adoption website where this dog was originally listed for adoption. I found that in busy shelters, dogs would frequently have photos that represented them that looked like this or worse, even no photo at all. Um, and I wanted to do better for those dogs and this dog in particular. And you know what? I did. Now, to be fair, this didn't happen overnight. I took this photo about eight years or so after stepping into my very first shelter. But during that time, I got a lot of practice. Um, I built a business and I learned a ton of tricks, tricks that I am here to share with you today. Tricks that would help me transform a dog's image from something like this to this. Suddenly, photos that told a story of maybe fear or sadness could all be changed with a simple snap of a meaningful shutter. Imagine that, because this is the magic of a camera. This, my friends, is the power in a single photograph. The funny thing about following something that you're truly passionate about, though, is that it's the kind of thing that you, you just can't fake. And for me, what was so wild about that was like by proxy of keeping my head down and just kind of feverishly chasing this dream, people just started to notice. And it wasn't long before I suddenly had this like multi long year waiting list for private clients for dog photo shoots in my local area and people even traveling to me with their dogs from all across the U.S., Big brands started to get behind what I do and some very cool opportunities came my way, including developing a working relationship with National Geographic, which was 
totally mind blowing and every photographer's group dream. And the uh, the first time I ever got an email from, you know, a, at nationalgeographic.com email address, <laughs> I thought somebody was just yanking my chain for lack of a better term. <laughs> so that was like the biggest and most beautiful surprise of my life. Um, but, you know, then I would go out and about and find my work out in the stores. I mean, listen, I wouldn't just find it. Of course, there would be a long <laughs> business trend action leading up to the moment of, you know, these images appearing out in public. But it was so cool to see my work kind of out in the wild. Right. As they say, um, I started to do a ton of commercial photography work. Um and just, you know, kind of shooting these campaigns that were sort of like out of my wildest dreams. This shot right here ended up on the Jumbotron at an NHL hockey game in Nashville, Tennessee. And I am cracking up at how excited this man is about my success in this moment. <laughs> Thank you, sir. He's just as excited as I was. So he could stand in for me on the excitement factor. Um, but it was just kind of a wild experience to, to fall in love with something so much. And to have it all be driven by the passion that I have for dogs and wanting to capture that legacy, that spirit of canine in a single image to hopefully help dogs rewrite the endings to their stories at the shelter. And then that kind of all snowballed and moved and changed into this entire career that has taken me to places that I, I truly never dreamed would be possible. Um, and all of that, just to say that I genuinely and truly do believe that anything is possible. Um, you know, take it from me, the kid, you know, who grew up in, you know, um, on the bad side of town, <laughs> never thinking that there would be any opportunities for someone like me in the world um, and not really, you know, believing that this sort of career trajectory or path in life would be something that would even remotely be possible. I, I mean, jokes on me. It turns out <laughs> it turns out that you can do anything that you set your mind to. Um, and, you know, when I started all this, I never thought that one day I'd even become an author. I was able to write this book um, in 2020 during the lockdown when I was really stuck and like all of us, right? And had, you know, not, nowhere I could actually physically go. <laughs> I decided, okay, well, I guess I'll sit down and write a book and tell the world everything that I know. So um, this book right here that I wrote is like basically a giant expansion on what I'm talking to you about today. And, you know, in an hour, we can only cover so much, but in this 300 plus page book, there's a lot of stuff going. So <laughs> you can also check that out. My publisher is Rocky Nook. So you can just go to rockynook.com um, to see that or to find it, or you can actually also find it on Amazon which they probably wouldn't like me saying, support the little guy as much as you can. <laughs> and uh, I even got to do my very own television miniseries with Nat Geo Wild. Um, because for some reason, and believe me, I was still trying to figure out how, they really cared about what I was doing and, you know, where I was pointing my camera and what I was trying to say with my camera. And just in case any of you haven't, been able to check this out or haven't seen anything about the TV show. Here's a quick little trailer just to get, kind of give you an idea. Okay, kiddo, here we go. One, two, three. Every dog has a story. That's right, you're gonna make you a star. And every photo is worth a thousand words. I thought, why can't I treat dogs like fashion models? And adoption rates started to soar. Follow Kaylee on her journey. Woo! She's the hero that can stand for all these other dogs. To capture the true spirit. Yes, 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 the head tilt. Inside every dog. Holy moly, that's it. This is my mission, to help dogs. Paparazzi, new series premiere Saturday, September 15th at 10 on Nacho Wild. So needless to say, it's been a bit of a wild ride, a bit of my like a sort of like a pinch myself. Is this even real kind of scenario? Um, but you know what? My four legged clients, you know, the dogs themselves, they don't know anything about me or where I've been or what I've done. They don't care what brands I've worked with uh, to them. I'm just some sort of, I don't know, like tropical bird pointing like a clicky black box in their face. <laughs> and they just see, you know, this red haired creature kind of holding up this like black box. And that's that's all they know. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about that clicky black box lately. Um, we all have the same clicky black box, really. It may have a different brand name or some different numbers on the front, but they all do essentially the same thing. It's up to you what to point that clicky black box at. What's important to you? 
And hey, if your thing is dogs, well, then the good news is that I've uh, learned some really good stuff over the years at the shelters and at all the private photo shoots. And I am here to share that with you today. Um, so without further ado, let's talk about all the dirty little secrets <laughs> of dog photography. So the first thing that I want to start with, the first and like absolute most important thing is that you see a photo like this. But I want to make sure that you understand that this photo has so much going on behind the scenes to get to the moment of this particular image. So let's get one thing straight. Um, the dogs that I work with, really most dogs in the world, like like any living creature, are not perfect. I mean, I consider them to all to be perfect, to be fair, but <laughs> they're not necessarily perfect or well-trained, right? They're not necessarily agility dogs or show dogs and kind of know every command. And they're just normal family dogs, typically. They're not magical dogs from a magical land or anything like that. <laughs> um, because when I show you, the viewers, this perfectly prim and proper polished photo as the end result, what I don't show you is what it took to get to the moment of this photo. I did not show you this photo or this photo or that photo or that photo. I showed you only this photo. <laughs> and that really is marketing in and of itself, right? Isn't it? It's marketing at its finest. I just want you, the consumer, um, maybe the like the dog owner who's looking to book a photographer, right, for their like dog photo shoot and they have, you know, a budget. I want them to look at my work and think, oh, everything that she does is perfect, right? Everything that she does, like everything she touches turns to gold and it could not be further from the truth. But I think it's easy sometimes to look at the work of photographers that you admire and think like, oh God, you know, they just have it all figured out. It just, it just seems so simple for them, but I feel like I should just put my camera down now because, you know, I can never get a dog to just sit and stand still like that. Um, and I just think it's important sometimes, you know, to peel back the layers and say like, oh my gosh, hey guys, I got to show you the truth of this thing. Like <laughs> it is intense and beautiful and chaotic and a total mess every time I'm on location with, a, you know, for a photo shoot with a dog. But there are some little kind of tips and secrets and tricks that I've developed over the last 12 years of photographing dogs professionally and basically every kind of setting and capacity and with every different type of personality and breed and temperament, right? That I've developed this little toolbox to be able to work with animals in a really effective way. Um, and so that's what I'm going to talk to you about a little bit. So let's peel back the layers just a little bit. When it comes to dog photography, I always say that anybody who wants to be a dog photographer, if they come first from a background of dog training, they have a massive leg up on the rest of us because this speaking dog right here, speaking dog and knowing dog body language is the absolute number one skill that you have to master before you kind of attempt to become or uh, be, become a dog photographer or attempt to even kind of maybe include dogs in your photo sessions. Let's say, for example, you don't necessarily want to be a dog photographer full time or just only dogs, but you do love the idea of adding dogs into your family portrait sessions. For example, you, you know, have a family and they want to do that, the whole beautiful kind of family like holiday card photo maybe, but they want to bring their dog or their dogs and you kind of don't know how to deal with it. This will be great for you as well. Um, and then just if you want to take better pictures of even your own dog, um, listen, you know, every dog on earth basically has an Instagram today, <laughs> right? <laughs> so if you're one of those people with an Instagram for your dog and you just want to take beautiful photos and make gorgeous content, this is something you just have to know about. Um, it is the basis for the absolute rest of everything that you'll do in dog photography. Camera settings and the technique kind of needs to be innate when you're working with dogs um, because, you know, you have a, a dog that, you know, might be um, in the perfect golden light. You have golden, magical, you know, backlit sunlight that's just like ethereal and straight out of a fairy tale, right? And you have, um, you know, maybe you have all your settings up absolutely perfect in the camera. And if the dog just were to sit there and stay for one millisecond, right? Like all we need as photographers is one one thousandth of a second. If we could get him to stay there for one one thousandth of a second, we would get the photo of our careers. Um, but 
you know, in order to actually nail that photo, you need to know how to work with a dog. You could be good at camera settings and good at technique and the rules of composition all day long, but you have to know this. And I always worry that I spend too much time on this part because it is so important to me, but I realize that the fun stuff is camera settings and stuff. So let me just move through the dog body language stuff because it is incredibly important and we'll get to all the goodies, the camera settings and the lenses and things like that. Um, but I I'm starting with this graphic because I just need to remind you, you know, dogs don't speak English. Dogs do speak. Dogs have their whole own language going on, right? Body language. Uh, but they don't necessarily speak English. And with that said, that means we can't tell them what we're doing as photographers, right? Like, why are you making me sit here in these flowers? And why are you pointing this big, giant, clicky black box at me? I need you to remember that while it's e easy to anth anthropomorphize, I always have a problem with that word, anthropomorphize, Anthro, somebody put it in the comments, how to say it. <laughs> Actually, how could, how could you put that in the comments? <laughs> I don't think it would be easy to say that, but anthropomorphize. We tend to anthropomorphize animals, meaning that, you know, we kind of project like our human emotion onto them, um, which means that it's we try to relate to them as we are humans, but forgetting that they kind of have the this whole own setting um you know, of how they live life and their perspective on the world is different and their like their set of behaviors is different. Um so in dog body language, one thing to know for sure is that staring directly at one another, if you ever see two dogs staring directly at one another, um, which you often won't see, it's very rare, but if you do see it, it means that a fight is just about to break out. It is the last thing that happens before like a kind of a physical <laughs> altercation breaks out between two dogs. Um, staring directly into one another's eyes just isn't a thing that dogs do. And if you're a dog owner, you might be like, ah, oh, you know what? I get that. You're right. Like you don't, you don't see it happen often between two dogs. And also if you recall when you're, you know, or if you notice, I guess is the right way to say this when you're on a walk, for example, and you're taking your dog, you know, um, just for a walk up the street through the neighborhood and you see another dog, if your dog goes to greet that other dog, they always do this thing, right? Where they circle, they kind of circle around each other and they never approach face to face. They go kind of, they smell each other's butts, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, what a world it would be if we could all greet each other by smelling each other's butts. But, you know, that's how dogs do it because is it, it is incredibly um, aggressive in their language to stare directly at one another. So let me get to the point. <clears throat> what does this photo right here look like to you? This is me taking a photograph of a dog. From the perspective of a dog, this camera blows blocking my human face that they've learned that they've spent, you know, hundred years, hundreds of years now learning to read and interpret. I'm blocking my human face, right? With a, with a camera and then a giant round lens on the front that just looks like a giant eyeball. Um, so that is innately incredibly overwhelming and scary for a dog. So you have to learn some tips and techniques to, to kind of get over this hump of this being like, too overwhelming, right? Since we can't tell them what we're doing, let's work on figuring out how to read their body language. Um, so just to talk very quickly about dog body language signals, like, like I said, dogs, they do, they do talk. They have quite a bit to say, in fact. <laughs> um, but, you know, if we're not looking, if we're not paying attention, if we're not listening, we might not notice these things. So, um, you know, you just want to be aware and look out for these body language signals. I won't spend too long on these slides right here because we're going to get to some actual images of dogs doing these behaviors, which is, I think, a little more obvious. But a dog who's feeling submissive is going to be looking away from you, turning away, um, licking his lips, which you've probably seen quite a bit in dog behavior. Um a timid dog is going to be shivering. Sometimes you see them like shaking and shivering. They're going to have their eyes wide open, like super wide. Sometimes that's called whale eye and dog kind of training um, lingo, the whale eye when their eyes are so open and that you can see the whites of the eye on the edge, which you normally can't see. If you look at this photo of this, this adorable dog right here, you can't really see the whites of the eye uh, because he's just chilling. He's got a lot, he's, he's, I think eating peanut butter or something <laughs> in this moment. So he's, he's pretty happy. He's got intense eyes, but he's chilling. Um, I'll show you what this looks like though. Uh, a dog who is anxious or overexcited uh, is going to be like panting a lot. Sometimes we look at that when a dog is panting and we're like, Oh, he's smiling, you know, like he's happy. He's smiling. But sometimes the panting 
is is really a sign of stress. It could be also some other things. It could be like it's too hot, right? Like it's a sign of heat or dog is overheating. Um, but but a lot of times it's a sign of kind of uh, intensity and stress and stress. Um, okay. Moving forward, an aggressive dog is going to have, and this is of course the most important kind of thing you want to look out for in dog photography, because you want to keep yourself safe and your subject safe. Um, you're looking for that like raised hair on the, on the shoulders that you see sometimes, uh, if a dog is staring at you, like kind of really hard stare, like I said, staring doesn't usually happen unless there's about to be an issue, an unsafe issue, um, and a clenched mouth. If the mouth is like really hard, you're kind of looking for like soft, loose body language. If you think of like your average, I don't like to generalize based on breed, but if just think about your average golden retriever, for example, that you might know, typically you got a lot of like really loose, goofy body language. That's very uh, well-adjusted and comfortable. It's not across all golden retrievers, but I think it's a pretty good example of a breed that you can often notice really loose and comfortable body language in. Um, Let me show you why this matters, though. You're like, all right, Kaylee, we're sitting here going over dog body language. I want to look at these camera settings. (laughs) We'll get there. (laughs) But why is it important? It's It's incredibly important because, you know, if you have a beautiful, colorful, well-exposed, super sharp, technically perfect photograph of a dog that looks uncomfortable. All you have is a photo of a dog that looks uncomfortable. (laughs) You know, it's not good for anything. You can't put it in your portfolio. You can't show your client, you you know, unless it was for this learning opportunity and this kind of like um, kind of peek behind the curtain right here, these photos right here in front of you would never see the light of day because as a professional dog photographer, this type of thing is like exactly what I'm trying to avoid. My job is to capture these dogs in this incredible light, right? To make these like fairy tale storybook images of these dogs that will serve to capture their legacy for years to come. Um, And I can't be taking images of dogs where they look uncomfortable or unhappy or like I'm putting them through something awful, you know, nobody wants to hire a dog photographer to get photos that look like this. Um, So even though they're well exposed and they're colorful and they've got cool perspective, it doesn't matter. I, they would never see the light of day, like I said, if it wasn't for this. So in this top left frame here of the white dog, she um, is clearly like even if you don't know dogs that well, right? Like even if you're popping in on this presentation and you're like, you know, I, I, I don't know if I ever want to be a dog photographer. I don't know. I'm just like, I'm just wildly curious of what this is all about, but maybe you're not a huge dog person. I bet you, you can still look at these photos and say, yeah, you know what? These dogs don't look great. They don't look happy. Um, this dog in the top left is cowering and moving actively like away from my camera. My camera's too much. And in this particular situation and that photo in the top left, I have like an 11 to 24 millimeter on the camera at that moment, which means in order to get the dog that big in the frame at maybe like, say I was at 12 or 14 millimeters, I'm seriously two or maybe three inches away from her face with a big giant circle lens that looks like an eyeball, right? So that was womp womp, like my fault. (laughs) And also I I just, I, I have to respect these dogs, right? Like it's all about respect and capturing them at their best. I can't just force myself into their world. These photos right here are like me forcing the moment upon the dog. Does that make sense? Rather than the dogs giving me their best, rather than them giving me their true personalities and spirits and kind of souls, right? That's what I want to see. I don't want to be dragging these moments out from the dogs. I want them to give them to me. I want them to be like delivered to me because that's what they're ready to do. And it makes such a massive difference in the final image. Like when you're looking at a dog photographer's images, I think that you can resonate and feel when a dog is looking so beautifully comfortable and happy and you feel drawn in and you feel like, you know, his personality, right? Okay. So in the top right here, now we have a dog who's licking her lips and that might, it's quite minor. It's kind of a mild behavior, um, like a uh, behavior, um, you know, a show of behavior, I guess is what I'm trying to say. You know, you think, oh, well, maybe she was drinking water or maybe she was having peanut butter, but you can see from the rest of her body language with her tails kind of tucked right back there. And she's moving her body actively away from me. Like, ah, this is too much. Like I'm trying to be polite. I'm not going to bite you. I'm not going to do anything like super rude, but I am going to show you with my body language. Like, please pay attention. I'm so uncomfortable. Um, This little dog in the bottom left is such a great example of uh, a really like clear cut 
behavior that you see a lot in chihuahuas <laughs> specifically. All dogs will do this. All breeds of dog will do this, but chihuahuas just kind of show this body language a lot. Um, so this is like kind of the fight or flight, right? Like, oh, I got my little pop. Like I'm ready to flee at any time. <laughs> and then she's also got the hard mouth. Her mouth is closed. Her eyes are really big. She's super uncomfortable. And then the dog in the bottom right here, this pit bull with the three legs, she was such a, such a beautiful soul, but she was, she was not comfortable in this moment. This dog does does have ears, right? But you can't see they're completely pinned flat back to her head because she is so stressed out and her tongue is so far out. And then there's that whale eye where I said, when you can really see a lot of that white around the eye, that means the dog is, is pretty uncomfortable. Um, and then here's, you know, that same dog again that you saw in the, in that, um, that, previous slide. And this is another shot from the beginning of the shoot where I was like confident that she had warmed up to me already, confident that I'd spent the right amount of time with her, getting her comfortable with me, my smells, my gear, right? I'm like, all right, we're good to go. You know, we spent a full half hour getting her warmed up. Well, then we get her up on this cool rock that we found and the first frame, the first couple of frames looked like this. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't keep forcing this on this poor dog, right? You can't force it. Um, so we decided, you know what, let's get her down. Let's give her a breather. Let's take her for a little walk, get her some water. And then let's switch things up a little bit. Let's switch up the location. So we took this moment of this dog looking like this and turned it into this. This is the same dog 10 minutes later, or maybe like 15 minutes later. You know what I mean? Where we got her down off that rock, took her across the street, found a different location, and I changed my lens. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to be so disrespectful of her space. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move back. I'm going to put a lot. I think this is like a 50 mil, actually. So it's not even really that much of like a zoom, for example, but it's not a, it's not 12 millimeters in her face. And look at the difference between that dog and the one before. That's what I'm hired to capture. And that's what makes a massive difference in the final image of a, of a, you know, in a photographer's portfolio is another great example of a dog just really uncomfortable with the whole situation. You know, the owner's hand is coming in like he's really trying to help comfort her and make her comfortable with the whole scenario. But even that is kind of a lot for her. And so after like spending some time to really work with the moment, voila, here we go. This is the body language we want, right? So why does this matter so much? Well, it's because the previous photo is completely useless. And this is the type of thing that, you know, you can show the world and really be proud of capturing the true spirit of dog. Um, here's another great example. This dog was so scared. My heart just like bled for her. I felt so horrible. I mean, in my line of work, I'm photographing a lot of rescue dogs, dogs with backgrounds and histories and stories that we just don't know, you know, and we can't say what she's been through. We can't say what's so scary about me and this, this whole photography thing, um, you know, to her, but that's okay. We just work with it. We do the best we can knowing the body language, seeing this and going, oh my God, you know, she's doing the chihuahua thing. <laughs> she's got her paw up. She's got her mouth shut, her ears are back. She's, you know, anyone who uh, has ever seen a dog before in their life could look at this photo and be like, ooh, <laughs> don't put that in your portfolio. <laughs> and then, you know, so this dog took a long time. So this was at the very beginning of a shoot. And this next frame is about maybe 90 minutes later. And she finally gave me this beautiful soft body language. Now she's not quote unquote, smiling or panting, but she's got beautiful body language all around. She's engaged. She's comfortable with me by this point pretty obvious there, right? This is another one. This is a shelter dog that we went to do um, pretty recently this past summer. And uh, he was a great dog, just a lovely dog. What a beautiful personality he had. But at first, everything that I'm doing is a lot. You know, I've got the big clicky black box. I'm I'm a different person. Um, there's a new environment. We're right. We're out of the shelter for the day. We're down by the beach. There's a lot going on. Um, and I've got lighting sometimes, like in this case, I had extra lighting. So that's kind of a new, interesting thing for the dog to deal with. Um, so we started off with this and then just going, you know what, let's pull back. Let's take a minute. Let's read the body language and let's just cool our heels and become friends. You know, put the camera back in the bag for 10 minutes, you know, and then you get this. And this is what we're here for, right? This is how we're going to sell this dog to the world. This dog needs a family. This dog needs a home. People aren't going to be really interested in that previous dog, but this dog, this is the one. Right. And I think that this matters to conclude this little section here and I'll move, you know, on from here. Um, I think that the probably the biggest mistake or one of the biggest mistakes that I see in a dog photographer, like maybe a newer pet photographer or dog photographer's portfolio is that they're not quite up on the body language yet. And they're kind of sharing some stuff like that, like those previous shots that are kind of like the 
you don't want the public to see, <laughs> you know, as you're working through those moments. Um, I think sometimes you see some questionable body language in maybe a newer pet photographer's work. So I think it's massively important and something to just look out for, you know, just really pay attention because it makes a huge difference. Um, and, you know, you want your clients to look at your photos and feel like, oh my gosh, wow, my dog would feel so comfortable with that person. That person clearly knows dogs, right? They clearly love dogs. I feel like I can see the personality and the spirit in that dog in every photo. That is so cool. I want photos uh, done by that person of my dog, you know? So that's something really important to consider. And like I said before, just to button this section up more than anything at all, it's about safety. It's about keeping the dog safe, keeping yourself safe and your crew and whoever might be on location and just making a super positive experience for everybody. Um, I mean, you don't you want to walk away from the experience with it being super successful before uh, anything you know goes awry. So just always try to keep it on the up and read the dog's body language. All right. I'm off my soapbox now. <laughs> Next. <laughs> All right. So ready for one of my number one most effective, simple tips for dog photography. Ta-da! Get low, get low, get low, baby, get low. I didn't sing a branded song about get low because I don't think we have the rights to it. So I made my own. <laughs> I hope it worked. Um, so, yeah, basically, I think, you know, this is a great example right here of the way that we see dogs every day, right? Like we're people that live in the earth. We live on planet earth and on planet earth, there are a lot of dogs. And as much as I think dogs are the most spectacular, most remarkable, most magical creatures on planet earth, to be fair, dogs are a pretty normal sight, right? Like they're maybe more of an ordinary daily sight. We see probably 50 every day. If you live in New York City, you'll see like 100 every day. If you live where I live, you see one a day because <laughs> I live in the middle of nowhere. Um, but, uh, you know, we see dogs from standing height, right? Like we're standing up, walking around the world. We see a dog walk by. Cool. Maybe he's sitting. Cool. We see them from our valiant five feet, four inches above the ground. For you, that number might vary. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, that's like kind of the height that I see dogs from. So when you go to take a dog's photograph, if you kind of put in like very little effort and you just kind of stand up, right? And you're just looking down at your dog the same way you sort of see him every day and you just take a snap, you're going to get something that looks like this. And this is fine, right? This is a photograph that exists. It is. That's what I say about photos that I think are like fine. You know, they meet all the rules, I guess, you know, of like composition and they're, it's exposed correctly. But what is that? give us. It's fine. It exists. Now, here's a photo of the same exact dog in the same exact setting. Now, instead of me standing up, now I'm low. Now I'm in his world, right? So I've changed my um, my perspective and I've gotten on the dog's eye level and maybe even slightly like in my case, I like to go sometimes below the eye level and have them look down at me. And I think this relates back to when I was a little kid, I spent all the time in the world when I was like five years old with my one friend on earth who was my golden retriever, <laughs> uh, Ginger. And Ginger and I would go on all these amazing adventures. And um, I was always looking up at Ginger. Like I was always like sitting on the ground or even my little standing looking up because I was five years old and I would look up at her. And to me, she was a hero. She was like a superhero. And I, I thought, wow, like down here is where all the magic is, right? When you take a photo of a dog from standing height, you're just seeing something that's relatively ordinary, although we we dog lovers would disagree, but we're seeing something relatively ordinary from an ordinary perspective. So how do you make it extraordinary? You get down in their world. You immerse yourself in their world. The other reason that you want to get low is, of course, so puppies can get on your butt. <laughs> Just kidding, but kind of because that's great. But also <laughs> I was photographing another dog in this moment. And that is honestly typically exactly what I look like at any given dog photo shoot. Um, so you can't be too fussy about like dirt and mud and mushy stuff. That's OK. It's all part of the game. It's all part of the job. And it is a ton of fun. For me, here's a great example of me. Like I said, when I said sometimes I like to get like lower than low in order to get like lower than low, I can get a dog up on something. Right. So if I raise a dog up, well, now this dog who's normally maybe two or three feet tall, maybe three feet. Right. In this case, I, I could get him up like five feet tall and then I can get lower. And now suddenly I'm even shifting that perspective harder. Right. So I'm almost below the dog. And now I get an image like this, right? And when I want to get real extreme and I want to have that dog really come in close to my lens, I could get an image like this. <laughs> but this is like um, 
kind of this whimsical, silly, let's just distort, you know, reality and change up the perspective. Let's make dogs into kings and queens of their dominion. Let's make them into rock stars, into superheroes. Because I think traditionally in dog photography, you know, you'd often see dogs um, in uh, like I said, puppies in a basket in front of a uh, tie-dye backdrop or maybe, um, you know, uh, some really traditional portrait of a dog that hangs above a mantle in a gold frame. And it's maybe, you know, it's more of a traditional look. And that's great. I mean, that's totally cool. It's There's something for everyone out there for sure. But when I decided to start to photograph dogs and sort of the way that I saw them, it was let's like get really extreme and let's really be unapologetic about how magical these creatures are. Right. And like how colorful their world is. Um, so it's just some great examples of me getting low or really in these cases, lower than low. Like I said before, <laughs> get a dog up on something. Right. This dog was already really tall, Mowgli. I, my favorite thing about this photo, by the way, is the snot coming out of his nose <laughs> that you can see like dripping down his, his face. And he's so beautiful. Um, but he was like up on something and then also was, you know, a giant dog. Um, and then I was kind of like sitting on the ground beneath him. Same idea here, right? Like get the dogs way up on something and then I get low. Um just getting low creates this incredible perspective, right? Like it suddenly immerses you in this dog's world. Like they are the main character of the story. And that's the whole idea. I mean, they truly are like immersing yourself into their fairy tale, essentially. Okay. So let's talk about, we, we know about getting low now. We know how important that is, right? Like I think what's going to separate you, your work from maybe a, a snap of a dog that, you know, you're, your mom took and sends you in a text message. <laughs> well, hopefully your photo is going to be like a hundred times better than that anyway. But I think like your average person is always going to take that photo from standing height, right? Even I actually, honest to God, I even see a lot of pet photographers not getting low enough. And you're like, ah, if only, right? Like if only they were a little bit lower, that photo would be so much more immersive. So if you do this like consistently, um, getting on the dog's level, laying on your stomach, getting low. Even sometimes I dig a little hole in the dirt. I dig a little hole in the dirt and I stick the camera down in there <laughs> so I can get the camera even lower than like the earth, right? Um, it's going to make a big, big, impactful visual difference in your final images. All right. So Kaylee, fine. I know how to get low. I know how to read dog body language. Woo woo. Two good things. Um, so how do I get a dog to stay? Huh? Yeah, that's the age old question, isn't it? Like I said, these dogs are all real dogs, dogs from, you know, families that, you know, they're just normal, regular dogs, a lot of them, and they don't really have, um, you know, a lot of training. So how do I get a dog to stay where I want them to stay? Here's a couple of little tricks that I've got for you. This is one that I use all the time. It's super simple. Just tethering i.e. like tying a dog back to something in the environment. In this case, super simple thing. I loved this shot along this um, beautiful like sidewalk, kind of uh, brick sidewalk in Boston with the cool fence. This dog was just a little puppy, just a baby. She was not going to stay there. Plus there's, you know, a road and traffic. I'm not going to risk anything like that. So I have her tied on her leash just back to the fence. Um, you have to be relatively quick about this. You have to work swiftly, right? Because dogs are live animals. That's your inherent challenge with dog photography is they're moving and wigging, wiggling and wagging, you know? So you just got to move quickly before a dog gets kind of like stressed out or frustrated that they're stuck. But you just get them in position. You get yourself, you know, uh, ammoed up with some like good treats and some sounds, which we'll get into, which I should probably move on so we can get into it. <laughs> um, and then you just do right. You need your one one thousandth of a second. Perfect. Then untie them, call it a day. And then guess what? Voila! We have a little magical tool called Photoshop <laughs> where we can just take that sucker out and nobody is the wiser. These are sneaky, dirty secrets. Um, same situation here where I just had, I loved this scene, um, but the dog is on a dock. There's, you know, nothing to really get her to stay in place. So I just tied her back to this little boat cleat uh, just for a second. And voila, don't look too hard at that leash removal because it's not that great. Don't judge me. Moving on. <laughs> Sometimes if there is nothing to tie the dog back to in the environment, um, I will use a stake. So not sometimes when I say like, oh, did you bring the stake? I'll say it to my um, partner, Sam, who's on location with me all the time. And the client will be like, steak? You brought my dog filet mignon? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm sorry, S-T-A-K-E, steak. It's not that exciting. Um, but anyway, so we, we use that in case there is, um, you know, an environment just like this one where, 
there is nothing to tie the dog back to really, right? Like if I don't want a big bench in the direct background of my photo, I kind of have nothing else. So the steak is perfect because it just spins right into the ground, low profile, and it's a super easy Photoshop job and then nobody knows. Uh, this is kind of a fun situation where I used a person to hold the dogs back. <laughs> this is my friend, Paul, Paul Manning from the dog with the bow photography. Shout out to you. We were in Banff, uh, Lake Louise in Canada. Uh, and Jess was so in love with the scene, of course, as any human being would be. Why wouldn't you be? And uh, there was nothing, you know, you look at what they're sitting on. It's like a wooden dock, right? And then there's nothing but rocks, like boulders behind the dogs. So there's nothing in this case for me to tie these three dogs back to. Because these three dogs are amazing dogs. They didn't necessarily have like a solid sit and stay, you know? They weren't going to just stand there if I asked them to. So Paul, so lovely of him, went behind the dogs and sat behind them. And you can see his like knee poking out there. He's just holding the dogs back. And and then, you know, what happens is when I take the dogs out of the frame, I just make sure that my focus is locked and I don't refocus. So if you shoot back button focus, then you just take your finger off the back button. If you don't shoot back button, back, excuse me, back button, you uh, just flick your lens right into uh, just like manual, make sure it doesn't refocus and then take a clear shot of the background. And then voila, you have all the data that you need to just layer the two files over top each other in Photoshop. Doo -doo, erase Paul, add a canoe. <laughs> Actually, I think the canoe was there. But anyway, moving on. Oh, boy. Do I have something so metal for you? <laughs> Which is my favorite tool that I use at every single dog photo shoot. And now that you know the secret about the stump, you will see this little stump in probably, I don't know, 50% of the photos in my portfolio. And it is the same exact stump. <laughs> I bought the stump years ago before a commercial shoot that I was doing for a pet food company um, at the grocery store because <laughs> I was like, oh, man, I have all these little dogs coming. Right. And I need to get them up off the ground because when they're on the ground, they got a lot going on. Right. Like they're busy. They have things to eat. They have to chew on sticks and stuff. They got cool stuff to pee on. Right. They got to vomit and eat it again. <laughs> They have cool stuff to do on the ground. They have an agenda on the ground. But when you get them up off the ground, they suddenly like have a few more seconds to pay attention to you. Um, and if you have cool stuff like cheese or treats or toys, they might stay up there for a little bit longer. It provides a tiny bit of a mental barrier for them before they jump down, especially small dogs. Big dogs are kind of like, eh, you know, this is not a big deal for me to jump off of. But little dogs think a little bit harder before jumping off of it. Uh, with great uh, with with great stumps come great responsibility, which means just make sure, <laughs> you know, if you're ever putting your dog up on something, anything, whether it's a stump or a rock or whatever, just make sure it's safe and it's flat, it's even, it's not going to tip. Do your best to care for your dog model. Of course, that's safety. Safety is number one. But anyway, this little stump that I bought at the grocery store on the backside, which you can't see in this photo, it has a handle. There is a little handle on it and I take it everywhere. And the reason they sold it at the grocery store, by the way, if you're wanting to know, is uh, because um, it, oh, it's for, I believe, like campfires and stuff, right? So it's like pre-scored wood. So you could just take it to your like campsite and use an axe and cut it all up for firewood. But it has been my little baby stump now for years and I will never cut you. Don't worry, brother. All right. Oh, I got something cool for you regarding the stump. Check it out. And now for a short film presented by Sam Haddix, starring Kaylee Greer and Junie, called The Dog Who Won't Stay. Now Junie is in place for her photo shoot. She is on the ground and there's nothing to keep her in place. Kaylee Greer is down and Junie is off. She has the world's worst stay. What's Kaylee Greer to do? She picks her up, puts her back in place. Now can she make the journey back to her camera, back down to the ground with Junie staying in place? Kaylee's down and Junie's coming again the dog with the world's worst stay. And now enter the stump, a magical device purchased from our local grocery store and used for the sole purpose of getting dogs to stay in one place. Let's see if it will work on Junie when she is placed on or around the stump. Junie's in front of the stump, she gives it a sniff, and with a simple treat, she has her one paw up on the stump. Now she stands still, she flexes her weird ghost arm. Pretty weird, Junie. But she is staying. She's being a very nice girl. She's given Kaylee enough time to get back to her camera, lay on the ground, and snap her photo. 
this dog is the definition of a very good girl. Now, back to you, <laughs> and the <Kate>. credits. <laughs> That's my own dog, Junie. She is a superstar. She can. She's uh, the light of my life and a uh, really special little one. So she was a good candidate for the stump because the truth is her stay is tough. She doesn't stay for very long, but that stump works like magic. So um, just a really good, like a real life example of it actually working. And so uh, speaking of dogs on stumps and not only on stumps, but this section is about dogs up on things. Um, like I said, up on things helps with the perspective, number one, which is awesome. But number two, it helps with dogs staying for you, even if it's only for one one thousandth of a second, like I said before, which is all we need, right? So this is just some examples of dogs up on things that I photograph all the time. I'm like, oh, I've got to find, you know, examples of dogs up on things for this keynote. And then I realized like, oh, I do this at like literally every single shoot many times per shoot. So it was very easy <laughs> for me to find examples for you <laughs> of dogs up on things. Here's another stump, but this is not the grocery store stump. It is one that I found in the uh, environment. Even just like a um like a treat, like a trunk, like a stump that's still in the ground. That's fine. That does the job. How about a fence? That also works. What about a cat on a rock? Nobody told me there was going to be a cat in this presentation. I want to speak to a manager. <laughs> and if that angers you, what about three cats? <laughs> three cats up on a rock in New Zealand. Um, shout out to my friend Craig from Photography in New Zealand because these are his beautiful cats. Uh, how about sex dogs up on a rock? Um, getting multiple dogs up on something or multiple subjects, it's such a great way to keep them all kind of together and lined up on the same plane of focus. So for example, for Bernice Mountain Dogs, how do I get them? How can I shoot these dogs at like F2, for example, when I have so many, it's kind of dangerous to have a shallow depth of field. However, if I have a perfectly straight log and I know all their paws are going to be up on the log, that means relatively their faces and shoulders are going to be all on the same plane of focus. Voila! Now I can have a magical fairy tale photo at F2 <laughs> with four dogs. Brilliant. Um, how about having a perfectly little sized little tiny rock for each Frenchie? That sounds like a good idea. Three dogs up on a rock. How about two dogs up on a rock, but underwater? Still works, guys. <laughs> Still works. Um, <laughs> All right, I got to talk to you about the eyes. So the eyes are the windows to the soul, as they say. And I know that is a bit of a cliche, but honest to goodness, it must have come from somewhere because it is true. Um, in dog photography, if you don't have a photo with the eyes in focus, I feel like you kind of have nothing. Unless you are specifically taking a photo of like a paw or a tail, for example. Um, Ta -da! Here's a good example here of why is it important to really make sure you're getting the focus on the eyes. If you allow the camera to choose, let's say you're at a shallow, wide open aperture and you allow the camera to choose what it wants to focus on, um, usually the camera's autofocus system is going to choose like the closest element to the frame, the closest, biggest thing with the most contrast, right? And in a dog's case, that's typically going to be the nose. And the nose is often on your average dog a couple of, at least a couple of inches forward from the eyes. So make sure you always have what I use personally is a single focus point always, always on the eye. This is the example of what the camera grabbed when I allowed it to, uh, you know, pick. I kind of put it on, say, like a full autofocus zone and said, here's the zone. And it kind of covers the whole frame. You pick. This is what it picked. And then I said, hey, 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 I know better than you, camera. Sorry. As good as you all are, I'm still better than you. <laughs> and I know better than you. And I'm putting the focus point on the eye. Right. So that's the difference. Now, with Canon, there has been an amazing new development that has totally blown my socks off, just absolutely blown me away. I have the Canon R3. I bought it like single handedly for the animal eye autofocus, which is a new development, which is just an unbelievable foray into technology. And I got, managed to get a quick video of my dog just kind of looking around and showing you how the camera is tracking him as he moves. So check this out. Um, this is just, this is my sweet Joshua, just kind of moving around, right? And holding the focus halfway down and letting it look for his eyes. And you see the little spots light up kind of all over his face, but specifically, especially when I have a single focus on, it's just looking for his eye and it is wild. It is magical how well it works. Um, I had a studio shoot recently for a big uh, commercial pet food brand and they wanted lots of action, but in the studio. And so the dogs are like moving around left and right. And I just have this tiny window to be able to pick up the eye. And I just flicked it onto animal eye autofocus. And I have to tell you, like 
98% of the photos are perfect focus. So um, as technology moves forward, man, it's mind blowing. Um, eye contact is massive in dog photography. I think if a dog looks just barely off the frame, you kind of have no soulful connection, if that's fair to say. When you look at this photo on the left, um, you know, the dog is just looking probably like, I don't know, quarter of an inch off frame, but it looks huge to the viewer. Like there's no connection there. Right. But then in the photo on the right, you, this is where I have like real eye contact, you know, from her. And I, I think you'd probably agree. It's a much more endearing moment and photo. And speaking of the eyes, just talking about how the magic is all in the eyes of these beautiful babies. The eyes are the windows to the soul. I know you needed that song. Desperately. I also realize that it's 5 55 PM. So if somebody needs to scold me and tell me to stop, please do. <laughs> I have a little bit left, but you got to let me know if it's okay to go over on time or if I should just, no, should I? No scolding. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'll move faster. I'll try to go quick. <laughs> um, quick note on catch lights. It's obviously as in any portrait subject, it makes a massive difference. Some dogs have really dark eyes like this little Shiba Inu right here. So you have to be really careful where you play, kind of have the eyes positioned in the image because in this photo on the left, as he looks down at a stick in the ground, you're kind of getting no reflection in the eye, right? And it's not that endearing of a connection. And then in this photo on the right, um, just having him flick his eyes up very quickly, like holding a treat up, for example, just have his eyes flick right up towards the sky. And then you get this amazing sparkly looking kind of healthy, youthful eye, which is um, something that's is quite important in keeping your images looking like really fresh and really connected, I think, to the viewer. All right. So you ask me, Kaylee, what do you bring to every dog photo shoot? Um, and I'm going to show you. Here's the contents of my what I like to call my crazy dog lady bag. And I take it to every shoot. And it is uh, all kinds of all kinds of stuff just like this. It's kind of morphed and changed over the years, but it's always something kind of like this set up here. Um, things to get the dog's attention. So lots of noisemakers, different varieties of treat. Uh, I always have a 30 foot leash in there and that's for dogs who I'd love to get action shots of, for example. But, um, you know, they may not be allowed to be off the leash because they don't have a good safe recall and that's okay. This leash allows us to still be able to get um, action shots of of dogs, you know, who, who need to be safely tethered. <laughs> um, and that steak that I showed you from earlier, for example. So let's talk about treats uh, very quickly. Treats are probably the number one way to get a dog's attention when you're trying to take their photo. Uh, if you surveyed 100 dogs, 99 dogs would probably say, bring me treats. <laughs> Uh, and then the one dog who wouldn't say that would be like a border collie and they'd be like, bring my ball instead. <laughs> but you're going to get to know this about your dog, right? So you send out maybe your pre-session questionnaire to your client so you can learn a little bit about the dog. Ask them, what motivates your dog the most? Do they love treats? Do they love toys? Do they love you the most? You know, what is it that they're into? So most people can admit that their dog's number one love is treats. And treats are just so fun because, um, you know, you get these fun expressions when you kind of use treats and especially things that are like viscous like peanut butter. So these are like some fun peanut butter faces that I've gotten over the years, which is an awesome substance to really get dogs interested and keep them kind of busy and they stay in place while they're doing all this licking and these fun faces. Now with peanut butter, there's one caveat that I always have to say, which is just be really aware and careful which type of peanut butter you use. You just want to make sure that it's like good old fashioned peanut butter, uh, like Jif, if you're in the US is like a good, good old fashioned brand that's safe. You don't want to use health peanut butters that have xylitol or sugar substitutes in them because they can that's toxic to dogs and that can be really dangerous. So be aware if your dog can't have peanut butter, try cream cheese or try pumpkin, like canned pumpkin, because it's a licky substance and it keeps them going. Uh, for toys, uh, some dogs, like I said, very rarely, but there are going to be some dogs that are going to be more motivated by a toy. And the shots that you can get with toys, this is my dog, Joshua, for example. He loves his toys, although I will say he loves his treats too, because he was also the treat example, to be fair. <laughs> so he's pretty easygoing, but it's just a kind of a behind the scenes of me using a toy. Um, but you get some fun shots, like with dogs interacting with their toys. You get like these bright colors. It adds a pop of color to the scene. Um, so it's it's kind of fun to ask, you know, the dog's owners to bring along one of their favorite toys. You can even find things in the environment that the dog loves to play with and interact with, right? So this is my Joshua. He loves sticks. Sticks are, sticks are life. Sticks are his favorite thing. <laughs> so it's just kind of a fun interactive shot that gives a little bit more personality maybe than if he was just standing there. Uh, more toys, 
lots of balls. This dog was really into his ball, which was one of my favorite <laughs> shots of all time. That is the face of intensity. If I've ever seen one. Um, another thing that we use to get dogs attention is going to be sounds. Uh, and why do we use sounds? You ask? Well, this dog right here would be the perfect example <laughs> for the coveted head tilt, of course. Um, so some of the sounds that I use on location are going to be anything from like uh, a duck call that you can kind of blow into, right? Like a kazoo. Uh, you could use, you could take the squeakers out of toys and then just use the squeakers, which my dog so kindly unearths squeakers from his toys for me all the time. And then I just go, oh, thank you. Mom needs that. And I put it in my shoot bag. Um, you could use your own voice to make funky sounds. You know, you could bark, you could. And if you, if you kind of master the bark, <laughs> you can get dogs really interested in that. They really stop what they're doing and they really pay attention. Um, you can even just rustle around on the ground, like in the leaves on the ground and they pay attention to that. Um, especially like if you have a sight hound, for example, like a greyhound or something, and you have something fun to move around on the ground, they're going to kind of be more into that than they're going to be into a sound likely. Um, but here's a great example. Here's a little dog just chilling, sitting around, looking adorable and kind of aloof. Right. And then I just give like one, like honk of a squeaker <laughs> real quick. And suddenly I get this. So it's far more engaged, right? Like it's engaged, it's endearing. It's just so sweet and adorable. Um, another great example of a dog looking adorable and darling and aloof. And then, and this is, this photo is worth its own weight in gold in a different, in a different way, right? But isn't it nice to get this photo for the owner and then also this, right? Which is very engaged and endearing again. Um, let me give you a quick, quick behind the scenes, a little warning, a little PSA warning for you about sounds. Check it out. That is very unflattering of me, by the way, but let's just go with it. <laughs> do not, and I repeat, do not overuse sounds. You can't get to your chute and get out of the car and run wildly towards the dog, squeaking a ball 100,000 times. It so totally doesn't work. It is going to get old really fast. <laughs> And no violence, no, no violence on your clients. But um, <laughs> sometimes you feel like you want to do that when your client gets a hold of a squeaker because, my God, it can get out of control very quickly. Um, all right. So I'm going to move through this next part pretty quickly. Is it OK, my friends at B&H, if I go for like 10 more minutes? Yes. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. The powers that B gave me 10 minutes. Thank you so much. I'm sorry that, I, by the way, my time management skills are a real turd clearly we're, today. We're, we're here for it, Kaylee. You're, you're, <laughs> you're dropping gems. We're in. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate you. Um, okay. So let's talk about the camera settings. My God. You say, Kaylee, it took you 100 years to get to camera settings. That's all I came for. Thank you for waiting. I appreciate you. <laughs> Um, so I shoot with the Canon, like I said, the Canon R3. I only picked this up a couple of months ago. I think it's been since the summer now. Um, before this, I was on a Canon 1DX Mark III and the animal eye autofocus. I was at a workshop in Scotland that I was teaching with some fellow incredible dog photographers uh, who all had uh, Canon mirrorless. And I had very intense jealousy, of course. So as soon as I got home, I decided it was the right move, especially for the animal eye autofocus to be able to move into mirrorless. So this R3 has blown my dang mind. Um, let's talk about shutter speed, which by the way, if you don't have a Canon R3, if you don't have a mirrorless, if you don't feel like you have a super fancy camera, that's okay, man. I did not have a fancy camera for years. For like the first five, six years of my dog photography business, I was on a kind of a prosumer level lower end model of camera and all this stuff you're capable of. The only place that I feel that you really are going to see lots of differences is in like shutter speed and autofocus, uh, not shutter speed necessarily, but the autofocus capabilities uh, with speed of tracking and then also ISO capabilities. Um, those sometimes can make or break like deciding if you need to level up to a new camera um, because you want to be able to have some great low light capabilities sometimes with fast moving dogs. Um, as the sun sets. But let me move into this. So you're going to need to be at one one thousandth of a second or faster at all times when it comes to dog photography. I have to give you only one caveat. And that caveat is if you are photographing with lighting. So if you're using like strobes, uh, that type of lighting, you're going to have a sync speed limit, which means you can't go over a certain sync speed. In my case, I'm looking at one two hundredth of a second. I can't go faster than that when I'm using lighting. But in the cases of natural light, 
photography. You want to be at one one thousandth of a second or faster at all times. Um, so that's because why? Well, why? Look at the photo. <laughs> this is a great reason why, because these two dogs were sitting perfectly still, all posed and prim next to each other. Right. in this kind of dense, dark bit of beach in Costa Rica. And I was ready to get this perfect portrait of them. And then suddenly out of nowhere, this dog was like on springs and decided to instantly defy gravity. <laughs> And because I was all set and ready and excited and had my one one thousandth of a second dialed in just in case of the unknown, you know, because this is a live animal, um, I was able to nail this. Oh, and this and this and this <laughs> and this and this and this and this. And this. <laughs> So you just never know, right? Like what your dog is going to do. This dog was an absolute riot springing through the air. Um, and I was able to nail all those moments because I had one one thousandth of a second ready and dialed in because in these moments, in these moments here, I didn't have time to think. <laughs> it was just happening in front of me and I was getting it or I wasn't. Um, and here's another great example, you know, just of kind of the average shutter speed that I typically have on because I'm ready for stuff, right? One two thousandth of a second, one twelve. 50th of a second, um, one 5,000th of a second, loss of light in the atmosphere here. So I had the ability to really like dial down my shutter speed. One 1,000th one of a second. This is now, here's a good example of an action shot at one 200th of a second because I am lighting this shot. So keep that in mind. I was stuck at that shutter speed because it's a, a sync speed issue. Um, I, I don't want to say issue. It's just a limitation of using lighting. Uh, another lit shot. So I wanted to make sure I showed you these action shots that are also, um, you know, using lighting. So that limits me to one two hundredth. However, the light helps you really freeze the subject and really freeze the action. So it kind of gives you a little bit of a leg up. And so one two hundredth isn't too, too scary in those moments. Um, Okay, so let's very quickly talk about aperture. What aperture? Hey, Kaylee, what's the best aperture for dog photography? <laughs> well, that will be really up to you. I know, I hate to say it. Your stylistic choice has everything to do with what you set your aperture at. Now, for me, if you're going to ask me, Kaylee Greer of Dog Breath Photography, what's my favorite aperture for pet photography? I'm going to tell you like F16, F22, because that's kind of where I like to be. Um, in terms of like getting that look that I like to shoot, but that also requires me to typically requires me to add an extra lighting. Um, but let's just take a look. Like, what is your style? What do you like? You know, because this photo on the left here is F1.4, really super soft, shallow, sparkly uh, photo on the right, F16, you know, so you can see the dog's paws are in focus, the ears, the eyes, all the way back to the horizon line is all in focus, basically. So what do you like? You know, here's a great example of my little girl, Junie, at F11. Right. I don't think it's actually terribly special at F11. Um, it's probably because of the location and stuff. But hey, at F1.6, that's pretty magical. Um, you know, and that's just an in camera effect. That's it. So that's up to you. Totally up to you. Um, but ask me any questions you might have about that in the chat. Seriously, feel free because I'm happy to explore that and talk about it with you. Um, it really is a stylistic choice. Um, but, you know, it's it's a, a big part of, you know, the photography process and the visuals of it. So feel free to ask any questions you got about anything, by the way, in the chat. Um, OK, let me move through this quickly because I promised 10 minutes. So location for dog photography, there's going to be some things that are going to limit you location wise, actually kind of a lot more so than if you were going to, say, take a, a photo of an engaged couple, for example, or if you're trying to do maternity shots or family shots, you've got kind of a lot of options on the table for stuff like that. With dogs, you know, there's a lot of stuff you got to think about that you might not normally think about. So you got the noise level of a certain kind of environment. You've got to deal with like squirrels and birds and like wildlife that might be in the area that could really distract the dog. Uh, you don't want your dog to murder any squirrels on location. It's very embarrassing for everyone. <laughs> it's very awkward. <laughs> Um, no squirrel deaths. Uh, you got to watch out for foot traffic, right? Even bicycles, skateboards, things like that, that can really like alarm a dog. Don't be too close to a main road. Um, and actually contrary to popular belief, the dog park is the absolute worst, uh, location for a dog photography session. Uh, it is too distracting. Way too many other dogs coming in, bombing your shots. It's, it's just not a good spot for dog photography. You got to find somewhere like really quiet and private. Um, and then dog size features. You really got to think about the size of a dog, right? Like this little dog right here, little tiny pogey right here. He's, you know, two feet tall or whatever, uh, maybe even less. And I thought, oh, I have this great location in Boston. It's going to be sparkly. It's going to be magical. You can see the whole view of the downtown. You're going to love it. 
And then we got there. And let me just show you a quick preview of what this spot actually looks like, like in real life when you get there. This photo on the left right here, uh, excuse the engagement thing happening because that is someone's like a moment from someone's life. So <laughs> I've borrowed a quick behind the scenes from someone's life to show you what those stanchions that little pogey is sitting on actually look like in real life. Um, and the problem with that is, well, you know, there's a it's not really the best spot to put a dog because if you <laughs> if you look on the other side of it, there's like a, you know, seven foot drop to the ocean. So you're like, oh, crap. You know, you get there and think, well, this would have been great for like a human standing in front of it. Right. Because that would only be at their waist height. But that's that's too tall. It's going to be in, there's all this junk in the background, you know, and this photo down here in the bottom right is just showing you from a dog's level when I was there for a different dog photo shoot, just showing you from a dog's level what it looks like. It's all blocked by the, you know, um, the stanchions and uh, things like that. So I ended up having to put Pogi up on that stanchion that you see, which is a little dangerous. But I did have the dog's owner standing in the shot holding onto his butt. And then I ended up taking a plate of the background and then just photoshopping her out because it was too dangerous to have a little pogey up there by himself. Um, so always remember dog sized features, you know, the world looks great from standing height, but sometimes when you get low, it's just mud and rocks and dirt. <laughs> um, so consider what it looks like from a dog's perspective. This is just a slide featuring some like fun ideas for locations. You know, you could think of anything. I mean, you're really, your creativity is your only limit, but you've got to find places that are suitable for dogs and where dogs are allowed. Uh, so is your photo going to be somewhere? specifically like this. This is Venice, Italy. It's kind of obvious, right? It's a gondola and in the canals of Venice, or is your photo going to be anywhere? Um, and this is just generally anywhere, right? Like it's just a forest somewhere, um, somewhere with fall, obviously, but those are things that you kind of want to build into the narrative of your shot and say like, do I want this photo to feel like somewhere or do I want to just feel like this, this vague magical anywhere? Something to consider as you're shooting for sure. And then let's just move into lenses. This is the last section that I have to share with you here. Um, <clears throat> lenses. What lens is the best lens for dog photography? Again, this is so much up to you as the artist because every lens produces such a different look. But if you would ask me, Kaylee Greer, I'm going to tell you my favorite lens is the 11 to 24, the Canon 11 to 24. And it is a magical beast of a lens and it is so heavy, <laughs> but I love it. It is magic. Um, with that said, let's just take a really quick peek. This right here, little mochi is photographed at 50 millimeters right here. Um, love it. It's really traditional. It's really soft. It's lovely, right? Now let's take little mochi and photograph him at 16 millimeters. Same exact spot. Same exact spot. Didn't move him from those flowers. Um, right here, you know, we've got this really exaggerated, really wild and whimsical sort of moment. And then the other shot is quite a bit more traditional. So that's going to be totally up to you as an artist, right? Um, the shot on the left for full disclosure has lighting at it a little bit. You can see it in his eyes and the catch light. The photo on the right is just natural light. So that's the only other difference there. But you can kind of see the difference the focal length makes and the height of the flowers and the, and the exaggeration of it all. Let me just move through the lenses real quickly with you just to show you some examples. Um, these are all the lenses that I have in my kit that I use at every single shoot, starting with the 50 mil. Um, this is 50 mil, my settings I'm putting on, on every frame for you. So you can check those settings out 50 mil here, 50 mil with my little Junie and her best buddy Pogo, who also has three legs <laughs> so they can stand and th on three legs and solidarity together. Um, but they're the best of friends. This is 50 mil, just in my front yard. So this is a 50 mil in Bruges and Belgium. Uh, another nice natural light 50 mil shot. I love the depth of field of this lens. We got another one here. All my settings there for you. Ta -da! 50 millimeter magic. F2 with three dogs is a bold move, but I did it. All right, let's talk about the 35 mil. This lens is so special. It is wide without being like too crazy wide, but it gives you, and it's so, oh, it's so sharp. It is so sharp. It is probably my second favorite lens for dog photography. I can get these amazing puppy dog eye shots with a 35 where you stand way above the dog and you kind of, go over top and get these big eyes looking up at you. Um, the 35 mil allows me to get that shot with tall dogs. Usually I use a 50 mil for it, but if the dog is taller, like this is a pit bull mix right here, he's going to be taller. He won't fit in my 50 millimeter frame when I'm standing at five feet, four inches. So I'm looking down on him, right? So I need something wider. So the 35 mil is perfect for that, but it is sharp. And again, the depth of field is magic. I took this one in Rome um, at one o'clock in the morning, <laughs> 35 mil in Costa Rica. This is just that classic puppy eye shot in Boston. It's a beautiful way to incorporate some of the um, ground texture. 
This is just in my living room with my two dogs who are always smashed up against each other. It's the most beautiful thing on earth. 35 mil in New Zealand. Um, 16 to 35 is really what changed my career forever. This is the lens that I used to kind of create my, I guess, the signature sort of dog breath look. Uh, it's the first one I ever used to do that. Actually, the first photo that I ever took that sort of looked like my dog breath look where I thought, oh my gosh, I figured it out was on April 20th in 2013 at 6.33 p.m. I took this photo of this 17-year-old dog named Honey, and it changed my career forever because I found exactly the way that I've always meant to tell the stories of dogs, the way that I always wanted to represent them as superheroes. Um, 16 millimeter again, so kind of this wide look. This is with supplemental lighting, 16 mil. Lots of my favorite work shot with this lens, the 16 to 35. Then I started to go half underwater with a 16 to 35. So that is the only lens I go underwater with now because it's the one that fits in my housing. <laughs> uh, so these are all shot at 16 mil. And then I figured out that if I liked dogs at 16 millimeters, well, forget it. My world was going to change forever <laughs> when I put on 11 millimeters, 11 to 24 millimeters. Here you go. This is what you always wanted a wolfy wolf dog. I actually forget exactly what breed he is, but he's a magical specimen of a dog at 12 millimeters. That's all I ever wanted. I don't know about you. 11 millimeters here. This is a dog sitting at the end of a fallen down tree. So like this log is going kind of around his head sphere, spherically. 12 millimeters on a corgi, 11 millimeters on my little June. Uh, and that's the stump, by the way, down there that she's standing on the same stump. 12 millimeters on this little gorgeous guy, PJ, in the sunflower field, which helps me distort the crap out of that flower on the left, which is so magical and whimsical. 11 millimeters on a cat, another cat, another cat, a travesty. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. This cat's magic. 11 millimeters. I just took this one in Spain. Another uh, 14 mil with the 11 and 24. Okay, 72, 70 to 200. I swear this is the last thing. <laughs> Bear with me. <laughs> 7200 is a magical lens for dog photography because it does allow you to photograph those dogs that are a little bit more like timid or fearful or just don't really want you to be super close to them or in their personal bubble. And you get this beautiful, uh, you know, kind of um, compression and this background with this like really soft kind of ethereal look with the 70 to 200, especially if you're shooting kind of wide open. So here's some great examples of me doing exactly that. It's getting really far away from the dog and zooming in, respecting their space and still creating this kind of magical stuff. Um, this was a shot on the cover of Na National Geographic magazine. Whoa, 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 whoa. 200 mil in a forest in Spain. And my friends, before we go, and thank you, by the way, for bearing with my extra 17 minutes. I love you all. <laughs> Before we go, I have just one more thought to share with you. If I can leave you guys with one final bit of wisdom, it would be this. Your camera, your clicky black box is powerful. Maybe more powerful than you ever could have imagined. And you know what? It's up to you where you aim it. So I implore you, dig deep and find that thing that makes you tick that thing that sets your soul on fire. Because man, oh man, as far as we know, we only get one shot at this wild ride of life. So spend every minute loving it and create meaningful things. Aim that clicky black box in a direction that has the possibility to change someone else's life. Because you just might find it'll change your life in return. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for coming. I appreciate you more than I can say. <laughs> and with that, here's my thank you slide. And, <laughs> and with that, it is time for questions. If I'm allowed to have any questions at all, because I have egregiously went over my time. You are, you are most certainly, most certainly allowed questions. We would never, <laughs> we would never deprive anybody of questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really <laughs> apologize to whoever's next because I hope I'm not taking up their time. No, no, no. That's it. The, the, the good news is this is this is the end of the night for, well, at least for me. I don't okay. know about everybody else. Maybe <laughs> some people are waking up and just watching this. So if, if we've held you up and you have to get to work, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Um, so thank you. We'll leave, we'll leave this slide up so that this way people can find, uh, how to follow you, how to get in touch with you, all of that amazing stuff. Uh, do want to say thank you so, so much, Kaylee. The images are great. They really, you know, as I was looking through them, one of the things that really was amazing and 
I don't know if anybody else got this, is the way you photograph dogs is very similar to, or we'll use the word akin to, you know, shots of people. Like you would take a, a family portrait. That's the vibe I got from these dogs, which is awesome. It's like what, I mean, I'm a, I'm a dog guy. I've got a dog. I've got two cats. We have a, we have a zoo going on in my house. <laughs> I love it. What kind of dog do you have? She's, she's a Weimariner. She's a, she's a mix, but she's mostly Weimariner. And she's, she's like a, big, a William Wegman dog. She's a big doofus and just so much fun. She's exactly like me, which is why I love her so much because she's just doofy and silly. And <laughs> I love it. Have a good time. And, I love and it. That's, that's it. It's, she's an extension of me. We're each other. Um, it's so, so beautiful. <laughs> we really appreciate it. I'm going to mm. jump into questions here. Um, there's so many. I'm going to start off with this one because we've got a couple people asking about this in particular. With those shots that you're taking where water is involved, what do you do to protect your camera? Are you using an underwater housing? Are you using one of those kind of like Aquatech bags that are sort of like plasticky vinyl? How do you go about it just to keep your camera protected? The old school. I plastic, you know, grocery bag. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of options actually out there now. I, I've been seeing lots of different like kind of new solutions for it pop up all over the place, which is cool. It's making it a little more accessible now. Um, but it is an Ike light underwater housing. And that is for my it was originally for my um yeah, no, that's for my Canon uh 5D Mark III. So it was kind of like once I kind of retired the 5D Mark III and moved on to the 1DX. I thought, you know what, I'm going to hang on to this because I'm going to be able to do something magical with this, but something that I might not be willing to do with my other cameras, which is put it underwater, <laughs> submerge it fully in the Arctic, you know, ocean or whatever. Not that I've ever been there, but um, so it is an Ike light. And then you have to get, you know, depending on the lens that you're choosing to use, you have to get different size domes that go over your lens. Um, so that's why I said with the 16 to 35, I, I, I will retain that lens forever because that's the one that'll go underwater now because I have the dome that's custom for that lens size. So I won't be changing it anytime soon. So yeah, an Ike light. Excellent. And you know, there's a place you could buy that B and H shameless plug. All right. Moving oh on. yeah, there you go. <laughs> but uh, you got it. Moving right along. I got a ton of questions about this. Maybe we could dive just a little bit deeper, not too crazy, but lighting. Can we talk a little bit of lighting? What what lights are you using? Uh, how are you using lights? Uh, what power output do you use your, your strobes or, or maybe you're just using regular speed lights from Canon. Um, talk about it a little so bit. So I do use mostly strobes. Like when I'm lighting, it's mostly strobes. Um, there are a couple of shots in the presentation. I'll just pull one up real quick. For example, hold on, I'll get there. Cause I know I'm under the gun, under the gun. Here we go. Let me pull this up. Can you see that still? Yes. Okay, cool. So like this type of shot right here, there's, there's multiple lighting sources going on, but this is front lit with a Profoto B1 um, and a mm, beauty dish, I believe. I usually try, you know why I think this is the beauty dish? Because when I travel, and this was in Belgium, I'm usually bringing the Westcott Rapid Box because it is so lovely because it's shaped like, you know, a beauty dish, of course, but it is packable. I can put it in my suitcase um, because my traditional beauty dish that I use from Profoto is like this hard, you know, it's like a hard metal and I can't bring it anywhere really with me. Yep. Um, so this is going to be the Westcott Rapid Box beauty dish on a Profoto with in the back of behind the dog is a speed light. But this is like a cheap, cheap speed light that I got on Amazon because it's intended to be like put out in rainstorms. You know what I mean? <laughs> so if I break it, it's like $40. It's like a I mean, I probably shouldn't advertise it, but it, like it's like a knockoff, you know, kind of. I don't know if you guys have any like really cheap speed lights at B&H or if that's more of like a, you get it on Amazon, you hope for the best. <laughs> you hope it actually works when you get it sort of thing. But that's what that is. Just a cheap one in the back, but a pro photo in the front. Um, and then the other ones, you know, like kind of something that's a little bit more straightforward, my work, let me just pick something, something like this is a pro actually, this would have been an Einstein 640, which is if someone's looking to get into starting to use lighting, Einstein is an awesome in, in terms of it's a little bit more affordable. It does a really beautiful job, but it's going to be a little bit more of a entry level price point than like a pro photo. Um, so this would have been an Einstein 640. Uh, my issue, my challenge with it at the time was that the battery to power the strobe was separate from the light. It was not built into the unit on the pro photo. It's built into the unit. It is so much easier to run around and chase dogs 
dogs and move a light real time when it's all one unit rather than having this like bag on your shoulder with the light battery that's flopping around. So I ended up changing over to Profoto for that reason. Now, I'm going to guess that there have been advances in technology since I left Einstein uh, policy buff stuff, and they probably have the battery built in now. As well, Westcott has an awesome light called the FJ400, which is also a little bit more of a a better price point for someone who doesn't want to make the full investment yet. And that's an awesome light too. I really recommend that one. So um, those are some good options, some three good options. When you're ready, I mean, I, I really highly recommend the Pro Photo because of the, um, uh, it's a really quick recycle time on the light. It's really fabulous, but it is, you know, $2,500, I believe. <laughs> so definitely, definitely. And, and if you're ever in the New York City area, we've got both of them in the store that you could test out. And come yeah, play with them. so I love know, it. Take a trip, make a make a a, a voyage to 34th Street, Ninth Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> come visit us. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt to do this. I I said this word last week and I completely butchered it, so I apologize in advance. It's the Brooklyn accent, so I'm sorry. If I, <laughs> if I do it again, I apologize to everybody out there, but. We got this question. I notice you sometimes cut the dog's leg at paw. Why do you do this? I, I am comfortable with being called out and I appreciate <laughs> you calling me out. Whoever said that. But with that said, I got to tell you, I don't tend to do that, but I will say that I put one photo in this presentation and it's this one right here that I was like, oh no, like this is breaking a really big rule of dog photography, which is don't cut. It's kind of like a portrait subject. You don't want to cut the paws off or like the legs off at this weird joint, right? Like it's weird. And, but I loved this photo so much. And I was like, oh no, I really shouldn't put it in. Cause it's not a good example of what you should do with dog photography, but I just love it. So I put it in anyway. And then I risk being called out. And then I was, and I appreciate you. Um, <laughs> other than that, I don't know that I do that except for like something like this, where it's a very intentional like headshot or three quarter, um, please seriously show me. I am wide open to your criticism or your just like awareness of it, but send me a thing that I did it at. I don't really DM try. Her. I try not to DM her, hit her up. DM on it. Seriously, DM That's me. Right. I'm happy to talk about it. And I just, I don't know that I did it anywhere else, but please <gasps> look at, Oh, do you know what? It's because that photo's crop to fit into keynote. The feet are really there. They're there. All right. But I we're, did we're find taking it. it back. We're yeah. Taking it back. <laughs> well, listen, I'm comfortable with it. Send me a message. There you go. Um, <laughs> Try not so, to do it, though. So talking talking a little bit about um, photo editing and things like that, we got a lot of questions about what photo editing software you use, um, just getting the particular look that you get. You know, you have a, a really dramatic lighting setup, very cinematic. You know, maybe you could talk a little bit about using the lighting and then kind of post-processing how you kind of pair them together. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the look, the look that I get in my photos, like if we're talking about, I mean, I know they kind of range a little bit, but for the most part, there's this kind of iconic, like, look, let's just use this photo. For example, it's kind of like, it's really wide angle. It's really kind of in your face. It's punchy, colorful. Um, and, and the perspective is it's a bobble, right? It's like a big bobble head. It's sort of in your face. Really, like I gotta tell you, like 90% of that look comes from the way that I shoot it on location. So it's picking a location for super like hyper color and sunsets, right? Like a lot of sunsets, a lot of saturated skies. A big like prerequisite for me is like looking at the sky on the day and going, like, is this gonna be a day that we can shoot or not? Because if there's no clouds at all in the sky, it's really not a good candidate for like a dog breath day. And then the other thing is if it's just too dark and gray and cloudy, it's not always great. Sometimes you're forced to shoot anyway, because it's a commercial job and you have no choice and you make it work. Um, with that said, it's like the location choice, the lens choice, right? So it's this like wide, wide lens, intentionally distorting kind of reality. And then it's the lighting, um, which allows me to keep a lot of vibrant color in the background because I'm not exposing, you know, I don't have to worry about exposing for the subject and the background in one frame, which is usually how you get like blown out white skies and stuff. I'm just exposing for the background. And then I'm adding my subject in and then I can worry about my subject light. So most of it is that. But for my prose processing, I um, I use probably pretty similar to your average photographer. I use Lightroom and Photoshop. So everything goes into Lightroom. Raw processing happens there. 
um, and then moves into Photoshop. And in Photoshop, really, my my goals there are to remove leashes because dogs are often on their leash, right? Or to move like eye boogies or um, sometimes there'll be like an owner's hand or foot in the frame. And so that's what I'm using Photoshop for more than anything. Um, and your know, basic stuff, basic color correction, vignettes, stuff like that to help draw your eye back into the center. But I really think most of what people are seeing in the look is really what's created intentionally on location. Awesome. Like, like Paul's knee. We got that out of there. <laughs> See, I remember, I remember good old Paul. Um, so we'll, we'll go to this one. Nikki, Nikki wants to know, is your show coming back? Oh, thank you for asking, Nikki. I appreciate that. I, at this moment, I don't have a ton of news on it. There's like a lot going on behind the scenes. There was like a merger with, you know, some with Fox and, um, Disney and Nat Geo. And um, so anyway, I don't know for sure what's going on, but I have something cooking. Just stay tuned. I have something cooking stay for uh, you, some future stuff. So we'll let see. Us, you let us know. You let us know on social if, if you I need will. us to get in there and drum up some, some you know, sound and let people know, hey. Please, I need sound. I definitely Kaylee need some B&H backing. <laughs> Help me out, brother. There you Come go. On. We'll, bring, we'll bring some muscle. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll we'll end. We got, we got a ton of questions. So I want to apologize if we didn't get to your question. I'm really, really sorry. We had so many questions and such a great response and turnout. For this event so we can't answer everybody's question otherwise kaylee will never get to leave and uh well it's know, mostly my fault for going uh no. for having i don't know zero time management skills maybe <laughs> it's okay you're you're, maybe a that. Photo- you're a photographer not a time management person. Thank you. exactly very Thank different. You. exactly very different. <laughs> um so so kathy asked this great question uh regarding your shooting style have you ever shot solo when she works at the shelter, she's oh. very much on her own. The shelter personnel are usually too busy with other animals doing other things. Any suggestions on working on your own? Do you have the ability? I wonder if she has the ability to have at least help from another vo- shelter volunteer who might be able to come along. But she said she's alone, alone. So, yes, I have. I have been, I have done shelter shoots probably truly like 100, 120 of them just alone. Um, It's harder. It's definitely going to be harder to use all kinds of lighting and different stuff like that. Like you got to keep the camera set up relatively simple when you're alone because most of your time will be spent managing the dog, right? Managing his energy, managing like getting a dog to sit still. In the case where I'm alone, I use that like tethering um the, the the tethering situation a lot where I'll tie the dog back to like the fence or the bench or whatever just for a minute so I can you know gain enough um momentum or whatever to kind of stand back from him long enough to snap a, a a nice shot it is really hard alone I mean I I definitely understand the challenge of that I've done many many shoots alone and now I do work with an assistant as often as possible so I think just tying the dog back to something and really building up that relationship with the dog one-on-one is the best I can tell you and the other thing is I'd said I might suggest a platypod um a platypod is a certain type of tripod it's incredible and it's kind of a kind of a newer thing where it's a, a tripod that's is perfectly flat and sits totally on the ground. It's great for dogs because it gets your camera really, really, really low because traditional tripods just don't go low enough for dog photographers. Plus the legs that stick out everywhere. It's too hard. It's a hazard with the dogs running around tripping on it. It's too cumbersome. But with a platypod, you can get the camera super low and then you can kind of like remove yourself from it a little bit while you manage the dog and then get back to it. At least it's ready in its position to go and it'll help you get that shot quicker. And I think they're actually coming out with a solution for Platypod to be able to put a light on it. To be honest, I don't know for sure. Just saying, just check don't out their website, her. check out B&H because they have Platypods, I believe, right? We do. We yeah. So check those do. out. This could be a good solution for dog photography. Awesome. Excellent. Well, Kaylee, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my God. Of course. For everybody who joined us. Uh, Huge thank you goes out to our hosts for this event over at Canon. Thank you, Canon. Seriously. Thank you so much. I'm humbled. I agree. Seriously. Thank you. Thank you for, for setting this all up for us. Made, made it easy for me. I just had to show up and hand the mic over. So, <laughs> And thank you all for waiting 34 extra minutes for me to finish. <laughs> yes. But uh, you've got, you've got you. Kaylee's info there. Uh, give her a follow. Check out what she's doing to stay up to date with her. Uh, but that's all the time we have for tonight. This has been another edition of the B&H Virtual Event Space. We'll catch you next time. See you later.